A tale of two worlds, two different realities with different needs, different dreams, and different ideas about the future. A boy with the power of a god in a battle to be a hero to all, in the end forced to choose and serving none. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code TOYGALAXY for $5 off your order today. Get ready for something you've never tried before, or rather, Magic Spoon in a way you've never tried it before. It's the same magic you know and love, but in a convenient, travel-friendly package. Magic Spoon's new treats are the perfect high-protein snack for on-the-go. They come in two delicious flavors, marshmallow and chocolatey peanut butter. They're just like the chewy, sweet, nostalgic treats you remember as a kid, but all grown up. Because Magic Spoon treats have only one gram of sugar, 11 grams of protein, and only one to two net grams of carbs, just 130 calories, perfect for pre- or post-workout fuel, snacks, kids' lunches, or just satisfaction for your sweet tooth. Magic Spoon is back with a 100% happiness guarantee, so if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. And don't forget, Magic Spoon ships to Canada and the UK. Be sure to check out both delicious protein-packed flavors. I'm partial to chocolatey peanut butter since they're the perfect replacement for the high-sugar chocolatey peanut butter granola bars I was already eating every day. Click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen and use the code TOYGALAXY for $5 off your order, or go to magicspoon.com slash toygalaxy to save $5 off your order today. Don't forget to add the marshmallow and chocolatey peanut butter treats to your order. And thanks again to Magic Spoon. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe is an animated series that originally ran 39 episodes over two seasons from August of 2002 through January of 2004. It's a reboot slash reimagining of the popular kids action franchise that kicked off in 1982 with a line of action figures from Mattel and a flurry of controversy for establishing the template for 22 minute commercials to sell those toys to kids. In the far-off land of Eternia, a never-ending battle plays out its next chapter. The heroic Captain Randor leads the forces of good against Keldor and his evil warriors. A battle to control not just the planet, but all the magic, all the knowledge, and all the power. Randor and his forces succeed in driving back Keldor, who in the process suffers a terrible injury that scars his face beyond repair. It's the beginning of nearly two decades of peace throughout the realm as Keldor's forces regroup and make plans to return one day stronger than before. Keldor, now calling himself Skeletor after surviving the battlefield injury that rendered all the flesh from his head, has located a gemstone to power a machine that allows them to smash through the force field, separating his dark realm from the peaceful Eternia. They assault the Eternian capital and take King Randor prisoner. All this on the young Prince Adam's birthday, a spoiled obnoxious teen who has never known suffering or conflict beyond combat training with the captain of the guard, man-at-arms, and his daughter Tila. But Prince Adam is going to have to grow up fast. The sorceress protector of the secrets of Castle Grayskull reveals to him that he is the hero destined to save Eternia from Skeletor and the approaching darkness. With a sword of power at his command, he can transform into He-Man, the most powerful person in the universe. Only the sorceress, the wizard Orko, Man-at-Arms, and Adam's friend-slash-pet Cringer know the true secret of Adam's new power and his destiny. Together with the other good warriors of Eternia, they will fight to protect the secrets of Castle Grayskull from Skeletor and his minions, or all hope for peace will be lost forever. Masters of the Universe, the toy line hit shelves for the first time in 1982. While it was a reaction to the popularity of Star Wars and G.I. Joe action figures, it was distinct among its peers for being a bunch of big buff dudes set in a fantasy world that was 75% magic and dragons, 25% lasers and technology. In 1983, Mattel partnered with Filmation to produce a daily syndicated animated series to promote the toy line and kicked off a national conversation about whether or not it was okay to advertise toys to kids via 22-minute commercials with perceivably little other value. Some said no, others said yes. I said, He-Man has more power than Jesus. He-Man has more power than Jesus. Within a year, the cartoon was airing in over 30 countries and over 100 stations in the U.S. It helped push Mattel's sales past their goal of $65 million to over $100 million. By December of 1984, the end of the second season, that number would push to nearly $500 million in sales. It was the most popular syndicated television program in the age 2 to 11 bracket, with 30% of the audience being girls. That said, by 1987 the toy line was dead, the cartoon was dead, and any hope of a revival related to the live-action movie was also... dead. For three years, in 1990 Mattel brought He-Man back for some new adventures in space! <laughs> 
A-Man was reinvented as a space farting <laughs> hero with a ponytail in a new anime-styled cartoon, transported across the galaxies to another world called Primus. E-Man carries on his fight against a cyber-influenced version of Skeletor and his cadre of evil mutants. New Adventures ran one season of 65 episodes from September to December of 1990 before it and the entire line of toys was swept under the rug of pop culture memory. Masters of the Universe as a brand was quietly retired for the foreseeable future. Development for a return of the Masters of the Universe began with technology. Were it not for the power of the internet to give fans a place to congregate and lobby the corporations responsible for the production of their favorite cartoons and collectibles as a singular voice, it is likely that Masters of the Universe ends in 1990. However, as the new millennium approached, the internet and World Wide Web changed the way that people communicated with each other personally, professionally, and unprofessionally. It changed the way products could be marketed and sold, and how data could be tracked more precisely to determine what products should be marketed and sold, and to whom. Mattel tested the waters for a comeback in 2000 when they released a commemorative line of Masters of the Universe action figures, reissues of some of the original 1980s line of figures in reproduction packaging. They then monitored the online response as the fan community continued to grow along with their demand for more He-Man. He-Man's return began the same way the original line began, with the toys, as Mattel contemplated what it would take to bring He-Man back, how he would look, and what toys might be included, they were approached by the Four Horsemen. Four Horsemen Studios was founded by Eric Treadaway, Chris Dahlberg, Jim Preziosi, and H. Eric Cornboy Mays, four artists who previously worked for McFarlane Toys. Through the late 90s, they made their name in the action figure industry with their genre-redefining character design and sculpture. In 1999, they left McFarlane to create their own company. For two years, starting in 2000, Four Horsemen worked with Mattel updating the designs of all the Masters of the Universe characters, their weapons, their outfits, and even parts of the mythology. Mattel refined those designs and the function of the toys with a thorough campaign of focus groups working directly with the kids they were going to be targeting both the toys and the supporting animated series, too. Cable television's insatiable appetite for more content through the 90s presented an opportunity for the cartoons of the 80s to become a valuable token for programming to kids of the 80s as they began to regret growing up and leaving the safety of fantasy worlds like Eternia. Reruns of cartoons like G.I. Joe, Transformers, and Thundercats dominated Cartoon Network's programming as those young adults longed for the familiar entertainment of their even youthier youth. It's Arrested Development. That said, after reliving the cartoons they grew up on, many of those fans desired something more mature, more fulfilling, something more suited to their increasingly adult sensibilities, but starring the exact same characters they fell in love with as six-year-olds. Wanna win the most powerful man in the universe? Toonami and He-Man are here to hook you up. Just watch Toonami this Friday and see back-to-back He-Mans. We are going to enjoy this. Log on to Nami.com. Register for your chance to win. 100 runners-up score a bashing beetle and a He-Man action figure. One grand prize winner gets the ultimate He-Man prize pack. Watch Toonami this Friday at 5.30. Catch a He-Man world premiere at 6. You do have the power. Sam Register, Senior Vice President of Content Development at Cartoon Network, credits He-Man's return to the fans directly, saying, quote, We got letters, we got calls, we got emails. Finally, we said, let's look into this. People between the ages of 23 and 29 or 30 who grew up on it are the hardcore fans who were clamoring for it. End quote. Mattel was on board for a new animated series as they too had recognized that the fan enthusiasm for the core brand had never truly dissipated. Instead of rehashing the exact same cartoon and toys as the 1980s, Mattel and Cartoon Network set out to create a He-Man for a new millennium. Filmation, the studio that produced the original 1983 cartoon, was closed in 1989 after it was part of a sale from parent company Westinghouse to cosmetics giant L'Oreal. Several new animation studios were considered to produce the next generation of Masters of the Universe, but Mike Young Productions was selected. According to He-Man and the Masters of the Universe producer Ian Richter, Mike Young Productions won the job because, quote, we knew Mike Young, Liz Young, and Bill Schultz would deliver a high-quality series for a reasonable budget. End quote. That's Cartoon Business 101, baby. <laughs> Mike Young Productions engaged writers and creators who previously worked on the original 1980 series and New Adventures. Michael Halperin, who created the original series and wrote the original Bible, was brought back to put together a Bible for the new show. Far more detailed with a greater focus on character development, relationships, and a deeper, more detailed history of Eternia, the series was bolstered by the inclusion of additional writers from the original series, Larry Dottilio and Michael Reeves, as well as animation veterans like Christy Marks, Dean Steffen, and Stephen Melching. 
While the general ideas behind He-Man and the Masters of the Universe remained the same, a prince who channels ancient power through a sword to transform into a superhero, the interpretation of those ideas was updated for the new era based on action figure designs Mattel had developed along with Four Horsemen. That said, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe was a kid's show, and the whole point, as far as Mattel was concerned, was to sell a new generation on Masters of the Universe toys while simultaneously engaging the older fans who were so hungry for more Masters of the Universe in the first place. To coincide with the cartoon, Mattel released a full line of action figures designed and sculpted by Four Horsemen, as well as corresponding vehicles and playsets, heavily influenced by anime trends that were exciting kids and adults across a spectrum of new and rebooted pop culture media. Despite their desire to age up the action figure line to appeal to older fans as well, many of the additional points of articulation the Four Horsemen intended to include were removed by Mattel to guarantee that they met all the safety concerns and price points for the younger demographic. He-Man's mechanical power sword was intended by the Horsemen to be a substitute designed by Man-at-Arms and the Sorceress because, in this version, Skeletor would have already possessed both the good and evil halves of the actual power sword. Mattel liked the mechanical sword so much it became the default power sword, but Skeletor still uses the two-part sword in the show, and it's even included with his figure. Image Comics published a new series of Masters of the Universe comics. Written by Val Staples with art by Emiliano Santalucia, the series served to fill in details that the show itself couldn't or wouldn't get into and ideally appeal to a slightly older audience. The comics intended to go deep into Masters of the Universe lore and mapped out a path that could have run for hundreds of issues. But Mattel had other plans and preferred to keep the comics within the same continuity of the series, deferring to what the show writers might want to do in the future instead of what the comics writers planned to do. Both the toy line and the animated series were cancelled in January of 2004, halfway through the second season. Fans have debated who or what was responsible for its unceremonious termination. Some blame the afternoon time slot, which was always changing, making the show difficult to find for even the most passionate fans. Some blame the adult collectors scooping up all the cool characters like Buzz Off and Manny Faces, leaving the shelves with nothing but He-Man and Skeletor variants for the kids just getting into the line. Some blame the shift to the Snake Men as the villains of Season 2, sidelining Skeletor one of the marquee names of the brand. Others blame a lack of interest from the beginning in the Four Horsemen's concepts, whether it be the unconventional power sword or He-Man's resemblance to Kato Kalin. Many, including producer Ian Richter, chalk it up to a hero and his world that weren't relatable enough to these kids today in their 2003 rock and roll music, I'm paraphrasing. Too much reliance on making it interesting for the adult audience, losing sight of the kids that were required to make it feasible to pay for the show and stock the toys on the shelves. Mid-season cancellation was indicative of a failure at multiple levels of marketing, but one that could be traced back to a flawed initial approach. Lack of commitment to one demographic or the other. Mattel hoped to create a new Masters of the Universe for both the 80s kids who were now adults and the new millennium kids who were currently kids. Each promise to one meant a compromise for the other. Maturity and gravitas, attempting to coexist with a 4 p.m. time slot and an audience under the age of 10. While it worked for Batman the Animated Series, they can't all be Batman the Animated Series. All 39 episodes were released on DVD in 2008. In 2012, for the 30th anniversary of the original toy line, Mill Creek Entertainment released the 30th anniversary commemorative collection of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe on DVD. It was a 22-disc set with all 130 episodes of the original 1983 cartoon, 20 episodes from the 1990 New Adventures series, and all 39 episodes of the 2002 series. Today, the entire 2002 series is available to buy digitally on Amazon, or you can check it out here on YouTube for free. After the cancellation of the cartoon, MV Creations published a comic called Captured, which brings some closure to the prematurely cancelled series. It's an adaptation of an unmade 40th episode script written by Dean Steffen. The Four Horsemen partnered with NECA Toys to carry on the design concepts of the series as non-posable statue action figures, or staction figures. Many of those design elements also influenced their continued partnership with Mattel on the subsequent Masters of the Universe Classics line of figures, and continue to influence Mattel's toys today. Because, at the end of the day, the Four Horsemen and everyone who helped bring Masters of the Universe back in 2002 were fans. And it's the fans who keep it alive to this day. That fan connection to the brand is one of the most important legacies of the 2002 He-Man and the Masters of the Universe era. As Masters of the Universe fan collector, author, and Hall H presenter Pixel Dan put it, quote, The 2002 animated series may not have met all the performance metrics in terms of ratings and toy sales, but it was the catalyst for the Masters of the Universe community as we know it today. It sparked the classics line of figures which powered the brand through another decade and into the toy lines we're collecting now. It's so important to this franchise's history and should be remembered first and foremost for that.
Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free, as well as behind-the-scenes features, sneak peeks at upcoming projects, and exclusive monthly podcasts about the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. And let us know in the comments down below what era of Masters of the Universe you originally connected with. For me, it was the original action figures and the show thereafter. I don't think it was the big buff dudes that drew me in. <laughs> it wasn't the fantasy setting, the crazy vehicles like the Land Shark or even Castle Grayskull itself. I think at the end of the day, it was all about the fact that my brother had absolutely no interest in it whatsoever, so it was something I could have all to myself. What's the old saying? Possession is nine-tenths of the love. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck.